Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of our new Sage 300 series, Working in the New Normal. Uh, my name is Steven. I'm the Marketing Manager at Acumen. And I'm here again with Ann Cook, who is our VP of Account Management, along with Nick Nabazi, who heads up our pre-sales team. Uh, if you missed last week's webinar, no worries. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel to learn more about how you can control your business in the new normal. Today's topic is automating processes during the second wave. And in this one hour session, we'll be looking into ways on how you can simplify your Sage 300. Uh, all attendees will be in listen only mode. And if you have any questions, then please write them in the chat option and we'll answer after each solution demo. Uh, so let's move along to the agenda. Thank you, Nick. Um, so during this presentation, um, our focus is to showcase how your business can benefit from automation by answering a few key questions. The first one, uh, why do we need automation? What parts of a business can benefit from automation? How do clients automate their business? And then again, we'll dive deeper into solution demos and open up the chat option for questions. Uh, we have a lot to cover today in one hour, so I will now pass it on to Nick and Ann to begin. Thanks very much, Stephen. So um, as Stephen said, today we're focused on automation, which is another key component or key tool or key mindset that you can take advantage of or, or implement in your business, especially in today's economy and today's new normal, quote unquote. You can't see me doing my air quotes, but uh, so why do we need automation? How can that help our businesses? Well, first of all, you know, one of the reasons I think automation helps is to really get your workforce uh, working in the right place at the right time. So, you know, reduce the need to spend so much time on data entry and, you know, allocate your team to more uh, important things, either revenue-based things or focus on your customer or spending time analyzing the business, right? So automate some routine processes that, you know, you might find you spend a lot of time on. So, Automation is also going to really reduce the risk of human error. If, if we're taking away key punching or data entry, we're going to get more accurate data, more accurate information uh, that can lead to, you know, better customer satisfaction, you know, and, and higher revenue down the road. Um, next is to, to streamline processes, to make sure that everyone is doing the same thing the same way, especially when we're working remotely, um, you know, and, and can't quite see the teams, but, you know, automation tools, they never take a break. They never, you know, get sick. They never do things differently. They always do it the same way, the right way, the way they're designed. And then lastly, uh, you know, to keep your business going, quite frankly, in absence of access to your building. You know, if I'm, you know, one of the examples I'm going to talk about is importing orders from a web store. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm at my desk or at my house or in my car, you know, that's still going to happen because I have an automated tool driving that behind the scenes. Now, what parts of a business can benefit from automation? Well, this is really a, a trick question. And if you saw our presentation last week on control, you know, I had the same answer. You know, every part of a business can benefit from automation. So we're going to show today a few examples uh, that we're going to walk through where we've helped clients over the last few months implement pieces uh, or tools or, or solutions that connect to Sage 300 to you know, add automation to their business. And you know, we're gonna show you a few examples, uh, talk through some scenarios. And uh, you know, these are things that clients have, have really implemented, have, have led to uh, you know, revenue growth, have led to better and stronger levels of customer satisfaction as well. So, you know, our focus is on a few things for the sales team, some back office accounting and purchasing, and also some operations and, and warehousing as well. So we're trying to cover a little bit for everyone on the presentation today. So my first example is um, an integrated web store and or customer portal. So, you know, what does that really mean, right? Well, well, if I have a website, which most of our clients do, you know, probably everyone on this call has a website, uh, but you may or may not have that set up or configured to be a web store. Well, 
how does that help me automate? Well, that's going to help me automate the process of taking orders. It's also going to help me automate the process of uh, allowing customers to pay if I have a customer portal. So I'm automating that revenue generation, and then I'm also ordering, uh, automating that collection process. And really, that's going to empower your customers you know, to place orders whenever they want to, and then also to manage their own accounts. It's, it, it, it's going to allow you to drive growth uh, for your business. And according to Forrester, 31% of companies have completed 50% or more of their total sales online in 2019. So, and that number is growing. Uh, so, and they expect that to be even higher this year. An automated web store and a customer portal uh, will work for both B2B and B2C scenarios. So selling to business to business or business to customer or consumer. You know, so many of you, many of our customers on this call can certainly take advantage of a solution like this. You know, lastly, uh, we get questions, you know, do I have to be a distributor or a manufacturer? And said, so, no, absolutely not. You know, a, a customer portal would work for any one of our customers. And we've even had customers of ours that are in service businesses or service-based businesses put up a web store where, where their customers can order services from them. So it's not necessarily shipping a widget, but it's buying a, a pack of hours, buying a solution, buying a, you know, an oil change or something like that. So, you know, just, just a different way to do business. So there's many, many options in the Sage 300 and third party ecosystem here. You can see Commerce Build, Conligo, North 49, Active and True Commerce. So I'm going to showcase just a few today that I picked out to, you know, to, to save some time and not go through every one of them. But, you know, here at Acumen, we can certainly help you select the best fit for your organization because each one, uh, you know, has some pros and cons and, and may fit your business a little bit better. So what are the benefits of a web store, right? Well, we talked about driving that growth and, and uh, how can I do that? Well, I could quite frankly, expand my sales territory or my sales area with a web store, right? You know, I might have a web store and sell to someone next door. I might have a, um, a web store where I might sell, you know, two doors down. I might sell two states down. I might sell um, two countries over from me. But, you know, you're, you're quite literally opening yourself up to the world and, you know, expanding that territory. You're also gonna let new customers find you with the right SEO solution and a good website that's informative and, and easy to use and easy to navigate. You know, it's gonna make it easier for new customers to find you, um, you know, generating more revenue. You have a, a much better chance of selling complimentary products. So increasing that, uh, you know, overall sale uh, because, you know, a lot of clients will see, a lot of customers might see something else, and I'm going to show an example of this, but might see something else that might fit or they might want to purchase at the same time that they didn't think of, and they're going to click on it if it's easy to do so and make that purchase. So studies have really shown that, uh, you know, for today's buyer, 57% of their buying process starts before they even contact a vendor. So before they're even reaching out to you or picking up the phone to you, you know, they're more than halfway convinced that they're going to buy something and, and ready to, to place that particular order. So, and then lastly, uh, you know, an informational website, you know, it could be really good, really informative, but it's just no longer good enough as buyers really want to not only find what they want, but they want to be able to purchase it at any time and on their own terms. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, some benefits and, and some examples of web stores. So here's a, a, you know, an example, and this one happens to be Commerce Build. And this is an example where we're showing, you know, different ways to introduce complementary products to drive additional sales. You can see that, you know, this customer is looking at a DeWalt uh, reciprocating saw here. You know, I might have some reviews on this. I might have some stock information. I might have some comments, some descriptions. But over here, I'm also suggesting some related items, you know, that they may want to look at or may consider purchasing as well. And at the bottom, I'm also suggesting that they add some additional 
components or add-ons to this particular product. So you might need extra blades or different kinds of blades or you know whatever goes along with the main product that the customer is actually looking at. So now all of this information is pulling directly from your Sage 300 and I'll say automatically pulling, right? So it's, it's in real time, it's fed up there. So pricing, uh, descriptions, uh, stock levels, if you want to, you don't have to show that of course, uh, you know, and, and pictures are all pulling through from Sage 300. Here's another example where a customer might be on looking at a particular product and you have various different options for that product. You have different colors, you have different sizes, so a one seat wagon, a two seat wagon. And so this is going to easily allow a customer to do, you know, a bulk order where I might pick two blue two seaters and three yellow one seaters in this case. So, you know, allowing your customers to easily navigate it very cleanly uh, and buy more, you know, Commerce Build told us that their customers, you know, who they're, they have web stores with that are connected to Sage 300 are seeing orders that are 31% higher in revenue than their orders that come in via phone, fax, or in-person order. So, you know, they're willing to kind of put the money where their mouth is and, and they're saying, you know, our customers are seeing much larger invoices coming in, much larger revenue transactions coming in when there's a web store because they're successful in implementing it. Now, a customer portal is uh, also a web store uh, in a sense, right? This is a way to kind of expose certain parts of your Sage 300 system to your customers to allow them to really manage themselves, manage their own environment. So you can automate their ability to pay you, to look at orders, to look at the status of orders, to see when, uh, you know, when other things are ready to ship, to see orders that they might want to click on a reorder button. And we're going to see some examples of that in just a few moments. But, you know, this one is huge and customers love this because, um, you know, they want to really, again, control their own destiny, right? So let me, what did I pay last time for that? Let me just pull that up and see it. And I want to click reorder and buy everything except those three lines again. No problem with the customer portal. You can easily do that. You're also automating the collection process, you know, sending out emails with a, a pay now button or letting them log into the customer portal, click on three invoices and click pay now and process a transaction directly to you, a payment transaction directly to you. So automating that and taking that data entry again away from your admin team. So all while increasing customer satisfaction. And then also is one that, uh, I don't always think of when I think about a customer portal, but is it is truly a, a great component or feature of it is it's another way to drive incremental revenue because it's just a, a another channel to promote new products, new services, or even promotions for customers based on what they've purchased, um, you know, in the past. So you can see that they've bought six red wagons and, and you have red wagons on promotion this month. So you might suggest to them that it's time to, you know, purchase this now in their customer portal. So here's a couple examples now for a customer portal. And this one happens to be from North 49. You know, I can log in, I can see my account activity, as we said, look at the transactions and see the status, see my orders, where they're at, copy them, reorder, all those types of things, uh, you know, pay on my account, uh, contact me, you know, uh, how do I contact them? I have, a, I have an issue with an order or a warranty thing. Well, right here, I can log into my portal, click contact us and be taken to the menu where I can select what this is contact or this communication is about and, and push that through and, uh, you know, very easily allow your customers to have access to your customer service teams, your shipping teams, you know, your, your back office teams. Here's another example, uh, jumping back to commerce build. Uh, this is a customer portal where I've drilled into some of my order history, but you can see, I can see similar information, right? I can see history, back orders, uh, you know, any quotes that we may have gotten from, from the customer, from, from the company rather, uh, purchase history, 
Um, but I can see here when I look at a particular order, I can see the status of it. Uh, I can see a document if there's any documents attached to it and open that up. But I can really easily view that order and click reorder here. So when I see what I paid last time for that, and I'm quite happy to do that again, I can open that up and click reorder. Okay, so let's stop there for a moment, Stephen, and, and see if any questions came in before we go on to the next topic. Yeah, so we did have a few questions that came in, um, but again, at this time, uh, the chat option is open. So if you guys do have any more questions, please feel, please feel free to write them in. Um, the first one that came in says, uh, do we have to have a web store to implement a customer portal? Oh, no. Good question. So we have had clients that, that do both, but that is certainly not required. You know, we've had clients that just went ahead and did uh, a customer portal or just, um, you know, just implemented a web store for now as, as kind of a first step. So absolutely not. They are separate, even though um, these different companies that we're talking about often do both because they do go hand in hand as a web presence for you. But no, they're completely separate and can be implemented separately. Thanks, Nick. And then another one that came in, um, it says, what are the prerequisites, prerequisites for customer portal impl implementation? Sorry, that was a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> so the prerequisites are you, you want to make sure you have Sage 300 configured so that there's information that can be exchanged easily. So I can, uh, you know, push up, and, and this is automatic, of course, but I can push up uh, the products or the solutions we're selling. And I, I want to stay away from inventory because, as I said, it could be services you're selling. It does not have to be a red wagon type widget, right? So, but we set that up in sales order entry. We set that up in, in inventory control, even if I'm selling services, and then that can be pushed up to the web store. And then in the web store, you um, you know, you can work with these companies like Commerce Build, like North 49. They'll help you with templates to make, you know, the look and feel nice and easy for your customer and keep them engaged and, and keep them clicking and keep them uh, processing orders. So, you know, we're going to work first on the Sage 300 to make sure the foundation is set up with the information you want to transfer up to the web and then work in the web uh, to make sure that it looks nice and then they're communicating seamlessly. Thanks, Nick. And then we'll have uh, one more question before we move on. It says, uh, do we have to be a distributor to make, make use of a web store? Oh, no, definitely not. So, um, you know, it's probably most popular with dis distribution companies that are selling widgets like we saw the wagons and the tools that I was doing here, but by no means is that required. You know, we, we've had plenty of clients that are in service industries uh, where you might sell a warranty service, you might sell a call out for a, a quote or an estimate, you might sell a block of time. So um, selling anything can be set up as long as we can put a code to it, you know, in our in Sage 300, we can push that up to the web. So, so absolutely, you do not have to be a distributor or a manufacturer, you know, selling widgets to, to make it to take advantage of a web store. Perfect. Thanks. Um, Anything so else come in? Nothing came in uh, as of now, so I think we can move on to the next section. Okay, and we'll have more time at the end for any other questions, uh, so feel free to keep putting them in the chat, please. So moving on, the next tool I'd like to talk about is a product called iMan by a company called Realizable. Um, this one is sometimes difficult to show because it is a, a piece of software or what we call middleware that's going to sit between Sage and you can see in this picture here, sits between Sage and lots of other different software applications or tools that you may or may not use, have or take advantage of or want to take advantage of in the future. And what it does is it automates the the data exchange back and forth, so it's bi-directional between Sage and those other systems. So I'm gonna talk about a few examples of that today to help you kind of see you know, the, the value in that. And then uh, you know, certainly would be happy to answer any questions about it and, and talk about all the connectors that it can, you know, that it can work with. So 
The first thing I thought would be helpful was to continue the the e-commerce discussion that we were just having. So if you, you know, don't already have an integrated e-commerce site, but you do have an e-commerce site that you love, you know, a Shopify or a Magento site like that, well, we still can automate the data transfer back to Sage 300 and then from Sage 300 up to there. So we call it kind of the, the four pillars, right? So those marketplaces, the, the actual e-commerce sites themselves, the shipping solutions that get involved when, when the product's going out the door, and then there might be bill of ladings, there might be cost that needs to come back onto the order for that shipping, and then lastly, payment gateways for those orders. So let's look at that a bit more and, and stay with that as our first example because you know we started with an integrated site. But so here's a here's an example of where IMAN would sit in the middle, in between Sage and those kind of four or five sections, right? So the marketplaces, you might be selling on Amazon or Walmart.com or eBay, right? And you need information to go back and forth. You know, Amazon's very specific about, you know, what information is exchanged and when it is exchanged, you know, or you could be, you know, taken off the Amazon marketplace. If you already have a, a Magento or a Woo store or a Shopify store that you love, uh, those are great solutions. Well, it doesn't mean you have to rekey all your orders back into Sage. We can still help with that and uh, use a tool like Guyman to sit between them. When, you know, shipping, now the product's going out the door and you might have ShipStation in there to manage all that. You're shipping cross country, you're shipping globally uh, with Ship Engine or Ship Hero. And, um, you know, you want those, those costs to go back onto your order. You want those charges to go on. You want the address to come over to the ship solution so that you don't have to retype all that. There's, there's a lot of data to be exchanged there, believe it or not, for printing just one label on a box. And so that, that can happen automatically. And then lastly, you want to take your customer's payment, right? Before that goes out the door. Well, if you have Paya or PayPal or Elevon or you know several others, this is just a sample. Um, you know, those can be put into place and then also communicate through IMAN to Sage and back and forth so that I can see payment status and email notifications and all those things that happen in a in a true web presence or a true web store presence. Okay, so this is just a, another example here of what a, a marketplace integration would look like for Magento. And the reason I like to show this is um, Iman is a visual designer. This is actually the product. This is a picture of the product where I can drag out certain pieces. I am not a programmer, I'm an accountant. Uh, so, you know, I like this because I don't have to get into writing code, but I can, I can logically see, okay, I'm going to read the orders from Magento. It's going to come into my logic and I may need to create a new customer in Sage if it's brand new. I may need to pull the order in if, you know, the customer's already there. I may need to update the Magento status on the site so the customer can see that we've got it. You know, it's been paid, it's being shipped, you know, all of those steps that happen. I might have some logic for also drop shipping, right? We may not have it, but we may be buying it and drop shipping it directly to the customer. All of this can be automated for you using IMAN. So no more data entry there or no double and triplicate level of data entry, which we see happens uh, quite a lot, unfortunately. And then over here, you know, back in Sage, now Sage is gonna push information back out, you know, back out to either a CSV file for upload somewhere or email notifications out to customer when shipments happen or, you know, other Sage databases to update certain things in Sage. So, you know, I, I just wanted to show that because um, I like that it's a visual tool and it's not, not programming, not coding. So it's certainly something that uh, I can understand. And then to kind of move away from web store for a moment, here's just a, a quick sampling of a few other connectors that we've helped clients, uh, you know, um, implement IMAN for. So first is concur, right? So a lot of people are managing expenses. I know we're probably not traveling as much right now, certainly than uh, we were 
uh, you know, last year at this time, certainly. But, uh, you know, when that happens again, expense reports can be, uh, you know, something difficult to manage. And also we see a lot of duplicate data entry there. Well, the employees in Concur, as they travel, they're doing the, the bulk of the data entry for you and filling out their expense reports. Well, IMAN can pull that into Sage 300 and push that information out. So expense and invoicing from Concur can automatically be, be sent back and forth between uh, Sage 300 and, and Concur. Salesforce is another one. We see a lot of clients with uh, Sage CRM, hopefully, but if you have Salesforce, no problem. You know, we still can connect that to Sage 300, um, you know, and transfer lots and lots of data. So when a quote comes in and it gets accepted, you know, the opportunity is accepted, we can push that over as an order or you create a new account or a new contact. We can sync those between Sage 300 and uh, Salesforce. Other clients recently have had some point of sale systems that were very specific to their industry. And so we said, okay, fine. We took IMAN and put it in the middle and brought those transaction in as sales orders so they could be shipped and, and processed through the system. So, you know, we didn't have to rekey all of that data again. And then lastly, um, you know, just a point about automating data capture and data feeds. Well, if you have any other system that can, you know, export or, or get data into a format that we can read, there's a really good chance we can use IMAN or a tool like IMAN to pull that data in and then send that data back. So, you know, with text or CSV or Excel or JSON files or XML or database files, and I don't mean to get very technical today, but, you know, there are tons and tons of formats out there, which means it works with tons and tons of different systems. So it's a, a really good piece that sits in the middle. Okay, so let's stop there, uh, Stephen, and, and see if any questions about IMAN or connectors or middleware came in before we move on. Yes. Um, so one question that came in says, uh, will IMAN work if we have multiple Sage 300 companies? Yes, absolutely. So um, IMAN will, can be multi-company, multi-entity. It, uh, it can do multi-currency. So really anything you can do in Sage 300 IMAN will work with, which is kind of neat. So if you had a web store and um, in Magento and you sold different products on the same store and those were actually two different Sage databases, which is an actual scenario we had, you know, the logic in IMAN was smart enough to know to push it into the correct Sage database. Good question. Thank you. And it looks like we have one more before we move on to Ian. Uh, it says, will IMAN work with third-party modules? Yes, yes. Uh, it will work with any third party module that is uh, in the SDK. So a lot of the, you know, very, very popular ones, you know, it already has connectors with, but technically anything that's built in what we call the SDK, which means it's, it looks and feels like Sage 300. So the orchids, the Tyroxes of the world, uh, it will work with. And you can see here Sage 300, Sage CRM, HRMS, you know, all of those uh, other applications as well. Any other questions? Um, nope, I think that's all we have for this section. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Ian, and Ian's gonna take us through uh, a little bit about EFT, and then also alerts and workflow. Thank you, Nick, appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, hopefully everybody sees uh, EFT. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, as mentioned earlier on, my name is Ian. I head up the account management team here at Acumen. And uh, this afternoon I have the pleasure of discussing with you a couple of options again to really focus attention on automating your business. Um, not just now while we're going through this whole coronavirus thing, but definitely looking at going ahead and uh, improving your efficiencies going forward as well as, as competition is going to be increased, no doubt, once we get back to whatever, whatever normal becomes in the future. So um, particularly interested in, in cash management is really what EFT is uh, focused on. So we really would be looking at two different aspects of cash management when we're talking about the EFT product, that is getting money into our organization as quickly as possible, either after we have fulfilled a client's orders 
or if necessary as a prepayment before we go ahead and start fulfilling the client's orders. And conversely, to be able to keep money in our business as long as possible when we're making payments to our vendors for services or uh, products that they have supplied to us. So right now, obviously, uh, people are delaying payment to you. So one way of overcoming those ob objections or those obstructions to getting money into your organization is to go ahead and leverage the capabilities of direct debit, which is uh, an arrangement that you would have with your customer to allow you to automatically take money from their bank account and to transfer it directly to yours. And similarly, that instead of having to process checks several days before an invoice uh, falls due and having to take the time for that to be delivered to your, uh, to your vendor, you can actually delay the amount of time that it takes to go ahead and produce that payment and you can wire money very last minute to them using an electronic funds transfer. So we're really going to go ahead and talk around those initiatives that exist and how you can do that directly from within Sage. So the EFT product, as you can see, it's written in what we call the software developers kit. So it looks like Sage, it feels like Sage, and in fact, it will not work without Sage. So it's completely a part of the system. In terms of the options that we have when we're looking at uh, making payments to people, um, on the AP side, which is primarily what I'm going to be focusing on today, just in the interest of time, and uh, basically that seems to be what most of our customers are using EFT processing for, is actually to manage their payments to their vendors. Um, so some of the considerations that we have in here, it's kind of flexible as a product about whether we'd want to be able to go ahead and um, issue payments from batch ranges, a number of different batches at once. So we might have decided that we need to pay certain vendors out at a specific time. So we've posted those batches for vendors that we need to pay by EFT, but we wouldn't have actually physically created those EFT files just yet or perhaps there was a combination that those uh, batches may comprise check payments that still need to be processed, you know, the, old, the older style method, and which would also need to be processed next time we do EFTs as well. Um, certain companies that we've worked with would prefer rather to be able to go ahead and to create the EFT first, and then they don't actually mark the invoice as being paid in Sage until such times as that EFT has been confirmed that it has gone through. And some of the reasons that you might want to do that, for example, would be if a vendor has changed bank accounts and perhaps they haven't told you about it and that EFT payment failed to get to them, you'd at least then still have the option of being able to go back and uh, have another go um, and say, okay, I'm not actually going to mark that as paid and expect to see that coming out of my bank account until such time so I know that really has been a valid transfer to, to your vendor. Um, certainly if vendors have multiples of bank accounts, for example, they may have, you may have one common vendor, but they may have multiple locations, each of which has their own banking facility. And so you would want to be able to uh, create payments, which would go to any one of a number of their different bank accounts. And EFT allows you to do that. Um, because some of the information that you are transferring to your vendor, confirming the payments that you've made to them and the bank account to which you have wired the money, that can be pretty sensitive information if it were to get into the wrong hands. So you can have arrangement, arrangements set up with your, uh, with your vendor such that you would encrypt the bank account information that shows on, on the files that are being transferred. And similarly, you might even put a password on the remittance advice that you're sending through to the vendor, just heaven forbid again that it should fall into the wrong hands somewhere. Certain people might be working on a home computer and, and checking email that way. Not everybody has yet um, got uh, the ability to be able to work from a, a work computer being taken home. So there are certain instances why, uh, why those security concerns come to bear. And in fact, uh, next week, just a little uh, promo, for next week, we will be talking about hosting solutions that we offer, um, which could help potentially to alleviate some of those concerns. But uh, notwithstanding that, we can absolutely, as you say, put passwords on uh, transferred files in, in, the, in the meantime. So when we're working with our vendors, 
what information do we need to be able to get a wire to them? Well, of course, we need to know their bank information. So within the EFT vendor configuration, it's slightly different or supplemental information to that which you would normally maintain in the accounts payable module. And by that, I mean that we are going to specify how we are transferring information about EFT payments to a specific vendor. Are we going to be going ahead and sending an email to them? Or are we going to go ahead and communicate exactly the same way as we do through the AP vendor, which might be just you know, printing something out and sending to them, but definitely capability to send email. Um, and then of course, we have information that tells us which bank they use and their routing number and their account number. Typical stuff that you would expect. Um, for example, if you're getting paid, I suspect that most people on the, on the call today are being paid um, electronically. Uh, for payroll. Um, certainly that's something that we see probably most common uh, usage of an EFT payment and that's built into the payroll module is the capability of going ahead and uh, wiring money for payroll. So uh, pretty, you're all probably pretty familiar with how that would work. So let's go through a practical example of uh, what else we might need to use when we're talking about EFT. One of the biggest things that we'd want to make sure is that from a security perspective, we know who is able to get in and look at bank information and to protect the interests of our vendors, to be able to go ahead and actually see unencrypted bank account details. So without this security option being turned on, anybody who's using Sage normally would not be able to go ahead and see a vendor's bank account information. Um, that's particularly useful, you know, if you have an organization where you've got a number of different people that might be coming in for seasonal staff or something like that, it would probably be inappropriate that they should be able to go ahead and see uh, your EFT vendors bank accounts. So definitely Sage is very conscious of making sure that that cannot happen. So what does it look like in terms of actually going ahead and generating an EFT? Well, it's, it's pretty simplistic, to be honest with you. If we look at our payment batch here, you'll notice that in batch 56, I've got one payment. This is a normal accounts payable module, uh, the normal batch list. And in this particular case, for my functional, uh, functional purposes, I have decided that I want to be able to create the EFT file only when it's been posted in Sage 300. So let's go ahead and see what that file creation would look like. So within my visual process flow here, this is a, a standard part of Sage 300 as well, by the way. If you, look if you like the look and feel of, of this screen, certainly speak with your account manager. I know that uh, you know, Jen, Max, and Charity would be more than happy to go ahead and talk to you about this, but this is a standard part of Sage 300, which just kind of provides a nicer uh, interface for being able to go ahead and work directly in any module. And you can see on the left hand side here of my screen, um, I've got visual process flows for all of these that have been built out by Sage already. And they can be customized as well if you have additional report needs or you want to be able to follow slightly different processes. So I just bear that in mind as a supplementary exercise here. So let's say I want to create the appropriate EFT file for this batch. I call up my create EFT icon. I hit create and off I go. My EFT file is now created and is ready for upload to my bank account. Um, using today's example, I would be working on the premise today uh, for demonstration purposes. I don't want to cloud the demo too much or presentation too much with other scenarios, but absolutely we can also automate the uploading of that EFT file directly into your bank account as well. But for now, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and show you that here's an example of what that EFT file would look like. Here's my payment for $990.15 going out to my vendor, okay? And with their appropriate bank account information specified up here such that that could be EFT, uh, EFT'd into them. I'm sorry, it's over here. So uh, that's kind of the overview as to how EFT could be used. Uh, do we have any questions come in? Thanks, Dan. So yeah, we did have a few uh, questions that came in. Again, if you guys want to use the chat option, please feel free to write. Please feel free to write them in. Uh, the first one that came in it says, uh, "What bank formats can you use with EFT?" It's um, a good question. So, in in the EFT file option, when you go into create that, you'll uh, notice that it actually asks you 
um, what file format, sorry, that's on the vendor. It asks you what file format you want to use. So on the specific vendor, as you're working through, it'll say, um, you know, what, what, file, what file format works for that specific bank. And you can create hundreds of different file formats. So out of the box, there are something like, gosh, 160 or so different banks that have already been assigned. And as part of the product, um, ordinarily, Orchid, who is the third party developer of this, will go ahead and add in any other bank format, which is not currently supported. So I have not yet, uh, in working with them for probably 15 years with this product, I am yet to come across a bank format that they have not created with us. Thanks, Ian. Um, another one that came in says, uh, can I see who has changed bank information for my vendors? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, I should have covered that, and uh, I'll add that to the next webinar. Thank you, Stephen. Um, you'll notice that under reporting here, you've got various uh, audit capabilities. So if I'm looking at an audit log for my vendors and customers, what that will do, if I just go back to a relevant point in time where there may have been some changes, um, I can print this out as a report if I need to distribute it to people that go ahead and show what changes there. So you can see in here that the account name has been changed. The account number has been changed as well. So I could send this report to somebody if it needed to be done for uh, audit compliance purposes. If somebody's asking, you know, with a CPA firm that's coming in to do things, you could do it that way. Or also there's an on-screen inquiry that goes ahead and does uh, auditing as well that shows the information here if it's for internal consumption. Perfect. Um, we actually had one more question before we move on. Uh, it says, is there an AP workflow or approval chain that is a uh, precursor to the EFT payment that captures uh, depart de departmental approvals? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we'll do is uh, capture the name of the person who's asked that question, Stephen, and uh, we'll go ahead and send them the control webinar from last week where Nick actually discussed some solutions about that and uh, we'll copy in the appropriate account manager as well. So there's uh, varying ways of going ahead and doing uh, approvals before things get into the payment process. Thanks, Sam. Cer certain of our vendors might be looking to actually have purchase uh, workflows. So, um, and certain of them might be looking at actually having payment workflows. So some people control things at the purchase order to purchase invoice level, such there are controls over that. And certain of our, uh, of our customers would be looking at uh, controls around the AP invoice before that can be entered and the expense can be booked. And of course you can use both options. So it really depends what, uh, what the need is on a case by case basis. Perfect. And then uh, we did have one more question uh, before we move on. It says, uh, who were we supposed to contact to turn visual process flow on? Um, I see it for admin, but no one else. Okay. Uh, yeah, put in a call to the support desk and they'll be happy to go ahead and enable that for you for sure. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for this section. So we can move on to uh, Sage Alerts and Workflow. Great. Okay. Just give me a quick second here while I uh, change focus. Okay, so the uh, alerts and workflow product is actually a kind of a back, a back office application, if you will. Um, I wanna talk through the various kinds of things that you can do with the alerts and workflow product. So primarily from a simple alert perspective, why would we use alerts within the business? Well, we want to keep people informed as to what's going on um, on an automated basis. So uh, any specific data points that have occurred or equally any things that should be actioned which are time sensitive. So for example, I mean, we might need to go ahead and notify people in the organization that there are overdue invoices that as they're speaking with certain of their customers, um, they may want to know that that particular customer owes them invoices, okay? 
or any critical support issues that have come up. If you're monitoring a customer's environment, for example, if you're an IT company, you can use uh, Sage Alerts and Workflow to monitor activities there and anything that uh, needs to be proactively addressed from a support perspective, you could do that. Um, certainly contracts that are about to expire would be another good example. If you've got somebody that's in a service manager environment and you're a service provider, it would be nice to go ahead and get a notification that says, hey, you need to start working with your customer whose support agreement is going to expire next month. Um, so pretty much any scenario that you could really think of um, that would be pertinent to receiving a notification. Um, some examples, actually, it's a good segue to this. Uh, these, these are some scenarios that have actually arisen with some customers. Um, so why would somebody go ahead and use uh, Sage Alerts and Workflow is what SAW stands for. So Nick had mentioned in his section earlier on talking about DSO, right? The day sales outstanding. So wouldn't it be great to know that you go ahead and resend information to your customers who've got upcoming, um, upcoming bills and to go ahead and send them notifications of that X number of days ahead of time before they actually pay you. You can automate that kind of process. So instead of having to make expensive and time consuming phone calls to go ahead and get that money collected, you can use the, uh, the Sage, and, uh, Sage Alerts and Workflow capabilities to do that for you. Um, another example would be potentially on um, receivable or on payables rather. If you're purchasing products and particularly in a COVID era, everybody needs to be careful of their money. So if your particular vendor is trying to go ahead and pass on um, increases in, in cost to you, uh, wouldn't it be great if you could know that the cost of a new item or an item that you're now receiving or being quoted is more than, in this particular case, 15% above what your historic average cost has been. Alerts and workflow could absolutely go ahead and help you with that. And uh, you know that would be a good instance to be able to go ahead and jump on a, a less expensive supplier. Um, and there's actually a good article, if you guys are interested, um, Warren Buffett has got an interesting piece to go ahead and read about holding prices consistent or steady um, in the face of a crisis, because most often um, people have got this kind of technology to know that they're not necessarily being price gouged, but they're having uh, price increases put on them. So uh, anyway, get a chance to read Warren Buffett's article on, uh, on why you would want to hold your, your prices or your, your costs steady. Um, another good example would be uh, to be able to go ahead and monitor back orders, for example. So uh, as you're looking at uh, orders that you have and inventory is coming in, wouldn't it be great instead of having to go ahead and look and run a report, the back order report out of Sage, if you could actually have that information delivered to you automatically every morning of saying, okay, what, what products have we received in now? And therefore, what orders can we get out of the door to go ahead and get that, uh, you know, order to cash flow um, going as, as optimally as possible. So there, those are some good, good examples there. We'll, we'll come back in a moment to that. So in terms of the product itself, uh, what I want to do is go ahead and talk about the way that things work. So initially, what we do is we have internal or external, what we call subscribers to alerts. So those are people that uh, could either be in the office, that need to be notified of certain things, or externally, they could be vendors, they could be customers, um, anyone who is a specific subscriber. You can build out your own groups for this. So an example of certain groups that might consume different kinds of uh, alerts or workflows within the organization would be these groups that you can read as well as me. Right. <laughs> I don't want to bore you by reading stuff off of the screen. That's pretty boring. Um, and similarly, then you have individual members of the team. So you can see just for the purposes of demo today, I've gone ahead and put myself as a member of the finance team that any alerts or any workflow activities that are routed through the finance department, I automatically inherit those because I subscribe to that particular team and that particular team then subscribes to uh, certain events that take place. Okay, so in terms of events, what kind of events do we have? Well, in this particular instance, what each one of these represents is a connection to a particular type of data. 
right? So I've got activities that might be linked to order entry or sales orders, some people like to call it, to purchase orders, inventory, cash receivable, and accounts payable. So one of the things we spoke on last week that we, when we were talking about our controls was about managing the setup of new vendors, okay? And so wouldn't it be great if we could control the setup of the new vendor, but also go ahead and have alerts that potentially were distributed to the head of accounting or the head of purchasing or whatever that would go ahead and show that somebody had added a new vendor to the system. So what would that look like, I wonder? So if we were to go ahead and expand on this, you'll notice that I've got uh, various queries and events. So I'm gonna have a look at the events. I'm not gonna get into the query design today. That's probably much more of a, a technical layer than you care about. But uh, basically what, what it allows us to do is to expose any of the information about a specific vendor to go ahead and put in you know, their address, for example, and say, you know, what address has been created for a new vendor? Or you know, who added, certainly who added the vendor would be a critical question to ask, of course, as part of the audit process. Similar to that which we just discussed in EFT, it would be critically important as well to receive an alert that said who created this specific vendor. So we're going to have a look at this uh, new vendor over here. And really what I want to talk about is uh, the kind of left-hand side and the flexibility that the product gives us. So this particular event, it just, again, captions the name. that This is an event to review when new vendors are added. Um, if somebody is adding a new vendor, I probably want to jump on it yeah, relatively quickly. I mean, if somebody did decide that they were disenchanted with the organization and they wanted to try and go ahead and, and make some payments to themselves before they left, I probably want to know about new vendors pretty quickly. So this one's triggered to run every minute to go ahead and uh, notify me when a new vendor is, is done. And then in terms of the deliverables, I have uh, some flexibility about how exactly I would go ahead and, and distribute these notifications. So I could send an email or I could send a file. And then of course, you know, and there's, there's other means of doing delivery as well. You can see other options down the left-hand side, um, sending a text message, going ahead and do, posting something to a website, various ways of doing things. And lastly, of course, who, do, who subscribes to this? So in this particular case, the finance user group subscribes to receiving this. And of course, because I'm a, a member of that security group or that user group, then I too receive that information. So when the alert is actually enabled, you'd be able to go into the application events here, and we're getting short on time, so I'm not actually going to be able to go through and to generate one where I go into Sage and make a change or add a new vendor and you physically see the email coming out. But uh, you can see right here, this monitor under the monitor section is actually running. And so um, it's gonna go ahead and run next um, in one minute's time. So. Uh, and you can see that it's been running through various processes. I've had no errors with it. So life is running along exactly the way that I would expect that it should. And when that runs and an email comes out, you'll typically end up with an email like this. This is an order confirmation one. I could distribute this to a customer. I could distribute this to the account manager or to the warehouse that shows, um, you know, this particular order has come in, these are the products, these are the, this is the amount, et cetera. And uh, I could even, if I wanted to, uh, combine this with other solutions that we offer as well, to be able to offer a click through that somebody could get directly to their payment portal to be able to go ahead and make payment on this invoice as well. So um, I'm conscious of the fact I want to leave you guys some time for some questions. So I'll go ahead and stop at this point and take questions. Thanks, Ian. So we did have a few that came in. Um, first one is, uh, can I use Sage Alerts and Workflow to send reports? Uh, yeah, absolutely you can. So um, that can, so Sage Alerts and Workflow can actually auto deliver any report that you want. Those might be documents. Uh, you might need to go ahead and send bills of lading or delivery notifications or customer order confirmations. Um, pretty much, any, again, anything you can think of that you would want to generate out of Sage, you can absolutely go ahead and send, send out a report through the product, yes. Thank you, and then another one is, uh, what version of Sage do I need to be on to use alerts and workflow? 
Ooh, that's a beautiful question. Um, awesome. Um, you don't need to be on any version of Sage to be able to use the product. Obviously, we're highlighting it in a Sage environment about how it can be used. But uh, Sage, uh, Sage Alerts and Workflow is absolutely version agnostic to Sage. Um, it's actually connecting at the database layer. So any data that can be used um, can be exposed to the alerts and workflow and, and all of the normal rules still apply. So if you're using even a warehouse management system, let's say, or you, you've got a web store like Nick was talking about before, and there's data that you are, have access to from either of those systems, you could use alerts and workflow to send notifications, um, run reports, and, uh, and so on and so forth against those data sources as well. Perfect. And then uh, it looks like we have one more question before we wrap up. It says, uh, does Sage Alerts and Workflow allow workflows for all Sage main modules, G-L-I-C-O-E? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there are some pre-canned events. So uh, if I look at the application events that we've got here, this is actually a pre-bundled um, set of a suite of alerts that, that are there. So for example, if you're using order entry, there are all of these uh, various alerts that come out of that. So we've got, you know, six pages of alerts here with a handful on each. So 33 or 30, 30 whatever roughly alerts out of the box that relate to order entry. And similarly on the purchase module, there's a whole bunch of pre-canned um, alerts there as well. So yes, you can use it with any module. Again, and also bear in mind, this works at the database level. So even if there's uh, something in here that, or you're using something in addition to a core module, you can build alerts around that as well. In fact, I've seen a demo once at a, at a conference and it just absolutely blew my mind and Nick's probably seen it as well. Um, a guy obviously using his cell phone and taking advantage of the fact that the alerts and workflow engine can work with text input. He stood in front of us and he uh, sent a voicemail text um, to a specific uh, number, which is his, uh, you'll see here, it's got SMS capabilities. So he sent a text message to his server asking for it to run a specific report for a specific, for a specific period. And during the demo, that report was generated and sent back to him in the conference hall. And at that point, I was sold. I was like, wow, crazy. Awesome. And then we, uh, we actually have one more question. Uh, it says, can we use alerts and workflow to send EFT payment notifications to vendors? Absolutely. Yeah, it's data that's available. So, yes. So I think that is all the questions we have. Um, if you guys do have more questions, uh, you can always email us at amacumenfl.com or you can reach out to your assigned account manager. Um, also, our phone number is 407-965-2411. Uh, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, we also plan to send out a server, survey monkey after this webinar. Um, so we'd love to hear your feedback on how we're doing or any suggestions on products or topics that you'd like to see in the future. Um, our next webinar will be next Thursday. And the topic is uh, improving performance with enhanced visibility. Uh, so be sure to look out for a reminder next week. And we hope to see you guys there. Again, guys, thanks for everything. Thanks for uh, the great presentation, Nick and Ann. And uh, we hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time.